You found uh, two bodies. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. I wonder if Vince being alive. In this day and age, many people are in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or even more photographs throughout the course of their lifetime. It's crazy to think that each one of us one day will be in our very last picture. The last picture of people in these stories was taken way too soon because these people were victims of murder. The following stories tell the tale of haunting last photographs of people before they were killed. We have two innocent little girls who were on an adventure that went terribly wrong. We also have someone who seems to be the perfect son become a family's worst nightmare. This case is extra horrific for many reasons but partly because the victims were innocent children, and also because this case has not yet been solved. The setting of this case is Delphi, Indiana. The victims' names are Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Abby was a redhead and Liberty a blonde. What you're seeing here is an old historic bridge that connects some hiking trails in the woods of Delphi. This is where Abby and Libby used to explore, take pictures, and spend time together. But unfortunately, this would also be the area where their young lives would be tragically taken away. Abby was 13 years old when she died, and Libby was 14. They were both full of life and the best of friends. They shared a lot of common interests, including photography, painting, and music. In fact, they both played in their school band. The girls were also into sports and were looking forward to playing on the softball team together. Like most teens their age, Abby and Libby were particularly fond of their phones. Ultimately, Libby's phone may be the key into unlocking exactly what happened on the day they died. That's because she managed to catch a short and grainy, but important recording of the man who likely took her and Abby's life. We'll get to the recording soon, but first, we need to discuss how strong Abby and Libby's friendship was, leading all the way up to their deaths. We didn't leave each other's side. I don't know what happened out there that day. Was there was a chance or an opportunity for one to break off or split or make a break for it or whatever, but you know, I look at it as, you know, two young soldiers that stuck, you know, covered each other's back. Two best friends, you know, I wouldn't leave my best friend's side. Since the girls were last seen alive on February 13th of 2017, the initiative to find out what happened to them has been nonstop. Countless flyers have been posted, billboards have been put up, tons of officers have fought for justice, and no one has given up the fight for the truth, and most certainly not the girls' families. Let's go back to the day that the girls went missing. It was a Monday afternoon, a winter day in Indiana. It was cold, but a nicer day than usual, which is probably the reason the girls decided to go hiking. The girls wanted to take pictures in the woods and look for animal tracks, something that they enjoyed often. At around 1.35 p.m. that afternoon, Libby's older sister, Kelsey, dropped both of the girls off at a country road near the woods where they planned to go hiking they would hike the Manon High Bridge overlooking Deer Creek. This is the same bridge where they were last seen alive. At approximately 2.07 p.m., Libby posted a picture to her Snapchat story that shows Abby with her head down as she carefully made her way across the bridge. There's a beautiful blue sky in the background and the sun shines down on her. It looks like the perfect day. Unfortunately, this would be the last ever picture of Abby alive. Alive, alive. Libby and her parents had arranged for her dad to pick her and Abby up at a certain location at 3.15 p.m., but they never showed up. At first, believing that the girls could have just gotten lost, the family searched for them on their own. But after finding no sign of them, they reported them missing at 5.30 p.m. that same day. That's when the search fully began. There was not one stone left unturned in the search for these girls. In addition to many officers and volunteers on foot, there were also helicopters brought in to look for the girls from above. 
The search continued overnight and included hundreds of people. Unfortunately, on February 14th, just the day after the girls went missing, police made a horrific discovery. We have found uh, two bodies. We are investigating this as, as a uh, crime scene. Uh, we suspect foul play. It was the news that nobody wanted to hear, and it shook the whole state, if not the whole nation, to its core. It dominated many news channels. State police and the FBI have been on the scene now for several hours. A number of units and teams have been here trying to gather. There were two bodies, and police had been looking for two people. But did these two bodies belong to Libby and Abby? That wouldn't be determined until a day later, Wednesday, February 15th. It was 2.33 p.m. when the announcement was finally made. Bodies are of, uh, have been positively identified as Abigail J. Williams, 13, of the Delphi area, and Liberty Rose Lynn German, 14, of the Delphi area. This is considered a double homicide investigation. Police have not yet felt comfortable saying exactly how Abby and Libby were killed or what sort of state their bodies were found in. This information will likely be withheld until the killer is finally found. Who would do this to two beautiful young girls and why? The police didn't know and they needed the public's help in figuring this out. They did have one thing to go off of though, the piece of evidence that Libby had managed to capture while being pursued by the person that likely killed her and her best friend. Liberty had the presence of mind uh, to turn on her video camera, but there's enough there that somebody could recognize this person's voice. This is the grainy picture of the man Libby took from a distance, who is believed to be her and Abby's killer. But there is also audio to go along with this creepy recording. The man can be heard saying clearly, was the man talking to the girls and telling them to go down the hill when he said this? It certainly seems like it from listening to the clip, but why? And had he already planned on killing them at this point? There are so many questions, and the Indiana State Police promised that they will never give up until the answers were found. Directly to the killer who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. The community was more than willing to help out in any way that they could. And in only a matter of time, more than 11,000 tips had been turned into the police. Libby's grandfather has often been the face of the investigation as he has come forward at countless press conferences to plead to the public for tips that may help them figure out what happened to the two girls. If somebody knows something, somebody has to know this person, recognize that voice. This case has taken a major toll, not only upon the families involved, but the officers who have spent countless days trying to get to the bottom of things. One officer choked up at a local press conference as he tried to express the efforts that were being put into finding answers. It's not easy, and a lot of people are putting a lot of work into this, and we're hoping that um, the tip's there, and we're gonna find it. While Abby and Libby's families have worked to find some sort of healing from these tragic losses, they have worked hard to make their happy memories with these girls well known. Libby's grandmother, Becky, recalled her granddaughter's ability to make the best chocolate chip cookies around. She was our baker. She could throw together a batch of cookies like nobody. She'd come in, have it done in half an hour or so, cookies laid out for everybody to eat the rest of the night. Libby was also the sort of girl who made it clear to her family members how much she loved them. This was clear by this note that she left for her grandmother to find in her car. I love you. Thank you for all you do for me and Kelsey. She was always willing to help others, even giving away her own money. Yeah, she called me one day, I'd, I'd given her some money for some item at school or function. It was probably a $10 bill or something. So she called me up and said, Grandpa, with the change, can I give it to somebody else or somebody who needs something here at school? I said, well, sure, you know, sure you can. So 
Uh, it's just the way she worked. While Abby and Libby's family and friends can find joy in their memories of the two girls, they also need answers so that they can begin to heal. They also feel as if they are owed these answers to the girls so that justice can finally be served. Nothing's ever gonna bring him back. It's our job to fight, to keep it out there, to do whatever it takes to find this person or persons that has done this to them. This is our job now. Abby's grandparents share the same goal. They have tried their best to preserve their granddaughter's memory, even leaving all of her things exactly where she left them before she died. Her things are still here. We just can't, we can't erase her from our lives and we don't want to. We treasure her coat hanging on the coat hook and her shoes on the shoe rack and her bedroom is just the way she left it because she may have walked out the door, but she's here with us. It has been a long time now since the girl's disappearance, and each day the officers involved in trying to figure out what happened cling on to the phrase, today is the day, hoping that it will be the day that the perpetrator will be found. Today's the day. Today's the day we're gonna get closer to the end. Today's the day we're gonna get closer to getting justice for Abby and Libby. We have all worked tragic cases, nothing like this. In July of 2017, police were able to produce this sketch of what the suspect in this case may look like. Another sketch was also released that depicts this man. As you can see, these sketches are quite different. One shows a scruffy looking older man that could be in his 50s, and the other shows a much younger looking man with a clean shaven face. While police cannot say why the sketches are so different, one likely explanation is that the suspect from the video changed his appearance so as not to be recognized. On December 26th of 2021, police zeroed in on one of their first higher profile suspects. This individual had a fake personality online and he would use pictures of male models to catfish girls. He would do this in order to try to get girls to send him nude pictures of themselves. His username was Anthony underscore shots. The man behind this profile is 27 year old Keegan Anthony Klein of Peru, Indiana. At the time that police began to focus on him, he was already in jail for other crimes, including child solicitation, child exploitation, obstruction of justice, and a slew of other things. Police interviewed Keegan, and while they say they learned a lot through him that has helped them with their investigation, they haven't said that Keegan was behind Abby and Libby's death. They have been very tight-lipped about where Keegan stands as a suspect. Police believe that the suspect likely remains in the tight-knit community of Delphi, hiding in plain sight. His ego has likely grown a lot due to the fact that he has managed to go five years without being caught. Even though so much time has gone by, the community of Delphi remembers Libby and Abby every single day. Not only was a memorial built in their memory, but so was a $1 million park where other children now play. As for the area of woods where the girls were last seen alive, most people stay away out of fear of what happened there. You know, I think a lot of people will still ask questions of what's gonna happen. You know, one of the things we did early on, probably within the first, I would say, 12 months or earlier was we had a time in which we reclaimed the trails. We walked over them, we prayed over them. And we said, this is going to be something that won't define our community. That'll help us to say, how do we move forward together? This pastor has made an effort to reclaim these trails as a part of the Delphi community. He even led a group down the trails and prayed over the ground. Police Superintendent Doug Carter wants to assure the world that he will not give up until he finds out exactly what happened to Abby and Libby. He also believes that the killer has followed every detail of their investigation. I still believe, even, even today, that he knows what's happening. He knows what's happening nationally. He knows what's happening locally. He knows who's covering the story and what's being said. In fact, Officer Carter believes that the killer is watching every interview and video coverage of this event. This could possibly even include the one that you are watching right now. He also wants the world to know that even though a lot of time has passed, this is nowhere near a cold case. They continue to gather more information every single day and receive tips from the community on a regular basis. 
They also have an extensive amount of evidence that they hope that one they will be able to share with the community. Anna Williams, Abby's mom, is looking for answers. Answers she knows she may never get. When asked what she would say to the person out there who knows what happened to the girls, she could only shake her head and say, We pray every day that we'll have peace someday. We just ask that people just follow that instinct, that gut. Even if you just have a suspicion, just, just call it in. If you believe you have any possible insight into what could have happened to Libby and Abby, the number to call is 844-459-5786. Or you can submit your tip through email at abbyandlibbytip at c-a-c-o-s-h-r-f dot com. Your tip may lead to the answers that so many are searching for. This man is Thomas Bart Whitaker, who goes by his middle name, Bart. Bart at one point sat on death row, awaiting the day that he would be executed. Despite what Thomas did to get there, his father Kent still fought for mercy for him, while also knowing that the days he had left with his son were likely running out. On one particular day, while leaving prison after visiting Bart, Kent believed that this could be the last time he would ever see his son again, alive. As we were leaving, we put our hands up to the glass, and he puts his hand up on the other side, and we smile and say, we love you, and then we, um, then we left. Kent was right to have this fear. This is because he and his family are from Texas, the state that executes more prisoners than anywhere else in America. He knew Bart would likely become just another number. Kent's decision to not only stand by his son but fight for his life is one that a lot of other fathers in his position probably wouldn't have been able to make. That is because Bart, the son he was defending, was found guilty of planning murders of Kent's wife and other son. This fateful day was December 10th of 2003. The Whitaker family had just returned to their family home after having dinner together. All of a sudden, a masked gunman entered their family home and began shooting. Kent's wife, Patricia, who is 51 years old, was shot and killed. Their other son, Kevin, just 19 years old, was also shot and killed. Bart, as well as Kent, were also shot, but both survived. Kent may have survived what happened to him, but he suffered far more than anyone else in this situation has. Not only did he lose his beloved wife and son, but he later had to face the reality that his surviving son was an absolute monster, willing to end the lives of his own flesh and blood. I am the single greatest victim in this crime, and nobody has to try to convince me of how awful this crime was. To understand how this tragedy unfolded, we have to go back to where it all began, in the beautiful Sugar Land, Texas. This area, once considered nothing but a suburban wasteland, was transformed into one of the most successful and wealthiest regions in the state. It was a safe area where kids could play outside and roam freely without their parents worrying about something happening to them. The Whitakers seemed like a normal, happy family. Their home videos portray this well. Both parents were devoted to their children and the boys had every opportunity to succeed in life. Bart was a sweet little boy that his parents loved to dote upon. His mother, who went by Trisha, used to be a school teacher, but later stayed home to devote all of her time to her kids. Bart and Kevin were not only brothers, but best friends who did everything together. Kevin wanted to be just like his older brother. He looked up to me and wanted to be me, and I thought that was so ironic because I wanted to be him. Bart recalls while sitting in a jail cell. It's hard to imagine that a child that seemed so sweet and loving was also full of rage that he would one day use against his own family. Bart says that he had a good relationship with his parents. In fact, it was more than just good. It was what most people dream of. His bond with his father was especially close even when he became a teenager. The two of them shared a mutual love for biking and would compete regularly. When interviewed about his early family life, Bart became overwhelmed and asked to take a break. 
it's all a lot thinking back on all the, those days. We had a pretty close family. Um, in terms of what was going on inside of me, that was a little different. Uh, never really fit in very well with anybody, to be honest with you. December 10th of 2003 was supposed to be a day of celebration. As far as his family knew, Bart would soon be graduating and later moving on to law enforcement. As a reward for his success, Bart's parents gave him an expensive Rolex watch. The dinner that they spent out at a seafood kitchen that night was supposed to be in celebration of Bart. It actually started off as a really happy evening as is evident in how happy they all looked in the last photo that would be taken of Patricia and Kent before they were killed. The two soon-to-be victims had no idea how their evening was going to end. In the picture, you can also see Bart, who was treated to his favorite dessert that night, bread pudding, to congratulate him on his success. It's hard to believe that while he has a smile on his face, he knows that in a matter of minutes, his family will be killed. Lots of laughter, yeah, we were happy and we were teasing each other, and, but then we did that whenever we were together. Out of everyone in the family, only Bart is aware that while they enjoy their dinner, an intruder has entered their house and is waiting for them to return. I don't really know a better term for how I was feeling other than I was in autopilot. I wasn't even aware of myself. The family drove the short five-minute drive home from the restaurant and went into what they thought would be the safety of their own home. Kevin was the first to walk inside, with Trisha behind him. This is when the shooting occurred. I went out to my car to get my cell phone, and I was, I was walking back from the car when the first shots happened. Meanwhile, Sergeant Marshall Slot, who had also spent the evening having dinner with his family, returned home to his pager going off. Sugarland is an incredibly safe area where little crime occurs. When Sergeant Slot calls the police station and finds out about the shooting, he didn't even believe the news at first. The dispatcher told me that four people had been shot. I initially thought she was joking with me. Uh, and I said, you're kidding, right? And she said, no. I need you to respond to Sugar Lakes. A family of four has been shot. It's hard to imagine why someone who supposedly had it all would ruin everything in the blink of an eye. Bart doesn't try to deny that he had wonderful parents, but he still tried to end both of their lives. The scariest part about this is that there was no reason why. Bart had money, he had love, and he had no reason to want to try and get revenge on his family. Kent remembers nearly every detail of the moment he realized he and his family were being shot at. I'm on the front porch, I hear a shot. Patricia saying, oh no, and then another loud noise. I didn't recognize them as gunshots. I didn't really understand what was happening. Bart also recalls how he was feeling when the first shot rang out. Nothing at first, and then the, sh the gunshots went off and chalk. Because Kent didn't realize that what he had heard were gunshots, he initially didn't think that they were in any danger. He thought it was just some sort of joke. I walked up to the door. All the lights in the house were out. But the street light showed a single figure in a ski mask, maybe six, eight feet away. My reaction was, I wonder which one of Kevin's goofball friends is playing a trick on us with the paintball gun. And I just stood there. But a moment later, I was shot too. Kent tries to call out to Bart to keep him from going inside the house. But before he knows it, a fourth shot rings out. A neighbor heard the gunshots and called 911 right away. A panicked voice can be heard saying. Things are hazy for Bart after this point. I know I ran into the house. They say I ran past my dad, but I don't even remember seeing him. I do remember getting shot. I do vaguely remember making the 911 call. At first, nothing seems too suspicious about Bart's 911 call. OK, where have you been shot at, sir? Oh, my arm. OK, Bart, who shot you? I don't know. When police first get to the Whitaker house, the first thing they find is Kevin, dead on the ground. One gunshot wound was found in his chest. Trisha is not yet dead, but she's in critical condition and needs to be airlifted to the hospital. She succumbs to her injuries not long after. Despite having been shot in the chest, Kent clings on to life. 
Meanwhile, because Bart was shot too, he appears to just be one of the victims in the scenario. He said, I'm Bart. He said, I live here, this is my house. So I, I figured, you know, he belonged there and I said, where's the bad guy? Bart had truly arranged for himself to get shot so that he wouldn't look like the perpetrator here. He wanted to throw the police off track and it worked just as he planned. All signs are pointing to this being a burglary gone bad. It appears as if someone had broken into the home and was in the process of robbing the Whitakers when they returned home. It doesn't seem like an inside job. The police comb through the scene looking for anything that might help them towards who did this. They end up finding a gun which they take to the lab, but there are no fingerprints to be found initially. After taking a closer look, they do find the imprint of a palm of someone's hand. But this isn't really much to go off still. Every piece of evidence that police manage to find turns out to be a dead end. It seems as if the killer has made a clean getaway. So the police head to the hospital to interview the sole survivors, Kent and Bart. They were in separate rooms. So we first went to Kent Whitaker. Kent seemed somewhat at peace. He was obviously upset, but not crying. But he very much demanded that we catch who was responsible for committing this crime. Kent was dealing with a huge mix of emotions. He just lost his wife and son and is trying to grapple with how he'll live life without them. While he wants revenge, he also wants to find it in his heart to forgive the person who did this. Kent prays to God for the ability to forgive the killer. And as soon as he does, he finds peace and a sense of comfort. As the case continues to unravel, police make a strange discovery. Bart had been lying to his family about his studies. Not only was he not about to graduate, but he hadn't even been in school. This lie begins to make Bart start to look more suspicious. Police can't yet pin anything on Bart since he too was shot that night. So they zero in on his friends. While Bart is hiding out in Mexico, little does he know that a friend of his has already thrown him under the bus. After being questioned by the police, a man named Stephen Champagne admits that he agreed to be a part of Bart's plot to kill his family. He drove the getaway car for another friend, Christopher Brashier, who was ultimately the one to commit the murders. Now that police finally had proof that this whole thing had been orchestrated by Bart, all they had to do was track him down. Eventually, they determined that Bart is living under an alias in Mexico. He's working at a furniture store and dating his boss's daughter. He is eventually arrested, charged with capital murder, and sentenced to death. When asked later why Bart decided to kill his own family, he referenced feelings that began popping up back in high school. While he loved his brother Kevin, he compared himself to him and felt as if he wasn't as good as him. His lack of confidence and feelings of inadequacy ultimately led to resentment towards his entire family. I don't think my dissatisfaction turned to outright hatred until high school. There was a point in there, I guess, sophomore year, where I was just so tired of being me. I was tired of feeling like a failure all the time, and I started to blame them for the way I felt. Um, and it wasn't something that I just decided one day, hey, I want to kill my parents. Um, it was just a, something to try to ease the pressure a little bit. Um, I wanted my life to be different. And however my thought process got there, I blamed them for me. I blame them for me being in existence. I, I want a revenge for being alive. Despite the pain and heartache of learning that it wasn't some stranger that tore apart his family, we know that Kent ultimately chose to forgive his son. He didn't forgive him because he felt that he owed it to him as a father. He forgave his son because of the love he had in his heart for him, even after everything. I think he's changed. Uh, but I don't know that he has. I can't truly read his heart. I thought I'd read his heart for all these years. Um, but I think I know him much better now. It's easy to look at this situation and wonder if Bart is just manipulating his father into forgiveness. 
which Kent admits could be true, but it doesn't change anything. He's proven he has. Uh, but my love for him and my forgiveness for him doesn't, isn't based on him changing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's between him and God and himself. Due much in part to Kent's fight for his son, Bart's sentence was changed from death by execution to live in prison without the possibility of parole.